so yeah, I want to talk to you because, um, you know, one of the things I do with this is, is just to talk about uh, people's career trajectories and mm-hmm. their interests and why they do it and how they got to where they are. And your resume is incredible. Like it's one of the <laughs> coolest resumes I've ever read. Um, so, so yeah, maybe a good place to start is uh, 1966. You show up at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Okay, yeah. I had a, a really incredible experience. I was riding on the Staten Island Ferry going to Wolf's Pond Lake. And there was, and I was already, I'd read all the local libraries information on entomology and all that and i ran into a a lady by the name of alice gray and so there i am on the ferry and there's this woman with about four or five other kids that are my age and she's got a giant seven foot butterfly net next to her i'd never seen I, i didn't even fantasize that anybody did that so i walked up to her and i just said you know what are you doing and she started talking about being an entomologist at the museum of natural history and we went us and I showed her my boxes. We talked about poetry, the gold bug, uh, uh, all, all kinds of things that were related to insects. And it was great because here was somebody uh, versus the the community I grew up in, which is one wonderful community. But it was basically a, a, an old Irish neighborhood where the idea of uh, being interested in insects was that you were an exterminator. And if you were really going out on a limb, you could become a veterinarian. But I didn't know how a veterinarian would repair the leg of a roach or something. But where is this? Is this in New York? This is 27th Street between 1st and 2nd in Manhattan, New York City. That's where I was born and raised. Mm. So um, it ended up one of those moments where I I was coming home now. And I took the ferry coming home with a, a buddy of mine. And she was on the same ferry. And they were going back. And so I got to spend another 45 minutes just talking with her. At the end of which, she said they were just starting the Junior Entomological Society at the Museum of Natural History. And would I like to come down and, and join or, you know, check the place out? So I was, uh, I grew up on the east side. Most of the kids who came, who I met at that first meeting that I went to, lived in suburbia, the dads drove them down, you know, it was a completely different socioeconomic group. Um, I'm sure most of them were afraid of me. (laughs) Uh, And, but under any circumstances, the true love was the passion for uh, the wildlife, especially entomology. And that started me on a roll that really changed my life. And up until then, the only thing I thought about being was a mounted cop. I really loved horses and I loved being a police officer, Mm -hmm. and I thought it was a great job. But then Vietnam came along, and it sort of lessened my enthusiasm for any kind of authority and what was going on during that period of time. And at the same time, a doctor uh, at the Museum of Natural History, T.C. Schneller, who was working on army ants, uh, called me into his lab, and he said he needed somebody to help on an NSF grant and that Alice had said that I seemed like a good prospect for doing that. And uh, it was a funny story because he offered me this, this job to help him with an with a, a experiment. He didn't tell me what it was. Mm-hmm. And he said it would be a part-time job during the summer. And uh, would I like it? Boy, I was honored. I said, "Oh, I'd love it." You know, it's great. Mm-hmm. And then he asked, uh, and then I asked him, "And what does it pay?" And he said, "Well, nothing. It's a volunteer job." And I looked at him and I said, "I think I'd really have a hard time going home and telling my dad that I was going to work for somebody for nothing, because his first question is going to be, when did you become a rich boy?" Uh-huh. And uh, so I said, "Thank you very much, uh, but I'm not going to be able to accept." And I started walking out, and when I and he, I could see he was sort of shocked, and because he was the chairman of the animal behavior department and all that. And I, I got to the door, and I was about to turn the knob, and he said, "Would six dollars an hour do?" Well, six dollars an hour is a lot more than I made as a delivery boy. <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Sure." So I said, "Well, you got a job. We'll do the paperwork tomorrow," and on and on and on. So the experiment ended up being something that. Uh, took away a lot of my zest for animal behavior in the academic way. And that was because what he was doing was, was wonderful. Uh, we were looking at whether army ants had different castes 
or whether it was a gradual graph that went up and down. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to do was take a colony of army ants, which, uh, which was hematum, about a three quarters of a million of them, and I had to take one out and put it under a microscope, measure the tarsal joint, and then put that on a graph. Mm -hmm. And then continue, and then put it in a pickle jar, and then in the other pickle jar, and then continue to do that. And I did it all summer long, and we came up with the fact that it was a graph. There was no straight line, although I didn't do all three quarters of a million ants. Yeah, uh, the data was sufficient to prove that. But in the process, aside from the fact that he liked to play classical music, and I was in a band and a bunch of other stuff, <laughs> uh, we got to be pretty good friends. But what killed, what really killed it for me, was something a little different. Uh, he showed me the first Eseton hematum that had been found. Now, it's not that it hadn't been seen by some other Europe, by some other human being, but it was the first one by the person with a with a European bent. Oh, like like he showed you the first specimen collected in a and that in was the in the field a, yeah. at Borough, Colorado Island. Uh -huh. This was it. Yeah, and she was in a pickle jar, and she was she was physogastric, so she was all blown up with this big head and these giant, you know, these big marks across the front. Yeah. She was gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Yeah, and so I took her out of the jar and I put her in my hand, and I was looking at her, and he told me the story about what was going on, and I asked him, I said, um, "And what did you think? Because she was alive when you found her. What did you think when you saw her?" And you were looking at her. And he said, well, I had to get her in a pickle jar. And I must have asked that question about four times. And he told me he put her in a pickle jar. Uh -huh. And I realized that at least from his old German or European school of thinking, that there was no romance to science. Uh -huh. It was all about facts. And I played in a band. I'd grown up uh, in a Catholic neighborhood in a Catholic environment. I wasn't looking for religion in it, but I was looking for some kind of spirituality. When I looked at animals, I didn't just see an animal. I saw something that was connected to everything. Mm -hmm. And those connections, in the end, uh, told a story about the environment that I lived in. And, and this was something I started feeling when I was in the third grade. Because we used to hear it in the Bible, you'd get about the different covenants, the covenant, God's covenant with man, God's covenant with nature, etc. But they weren't linked together. It was all about use. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember playing stickball when, when literally when I was in the third grade, we used to play in the cat alleys. This is in the alleys of New York City in the backyards. And, um, and that just we just had a, a priest come in and talk to us all about our position in the world and uh, the ether, so to speak. And I was, I kicked some cat manure out of the way. And these incredible black and red beetles ran out from underneath it. And I said, how do they serve me? I mean, how does this work in my mind? There's a little kid. And then I looked at this granite wall because New York City was actually built uh, by leveling the streets and, and fixing where the buildings went and all the rubble and the gullies and all that stuff were filled in with all the granite, etc. And quite often they made um, different terraces. So one side of 27th Street would be at one elevation and the other side of 27th Street might be higher or lower, depending on where you were. And those granite boulders all put together to make up the walls were the houses for amazing numbers of animals. There was all kinds of spiders and millipedes and snails, and it just went on and on and on. And I just kept looking at them going, I don't get the religious connection, and I don't think they care. Mm -hmm. And so that started me reading and questing in that, in that environment. Yeah, that's interesting because I, I can see it's like a huge thing to experience a museum, especially like that museum, as a, from the visitor perspective, especially from like growing up and like going to the museum. It's like the coolest thing. Like you see all these things on display and like pose and dioramas and it's like a it's a it's an experiential thing to walk into but then um there's another side of of that old school sort of museum approach of the curatorial pickle jar ish thing and that that other side didn't seem like interesting to you and your career is built on the front side of the of the right. museum as it as it was and, yeah and yeah but it, but but the Sort of what started it when I first got there, going to the Akeley Halls and seeing the great mounts and then mm -hmm. going into the back when I was 
uh, 17 years old, I got a 1209 key. Now, it's not going to make anything to your visitors. But basically what it is, is the key that allowed you to go into all the rooms and all the collections. Mm -hmm. So I could go into the museum by myself, go into the ornithology lab or the ichthyology lab, open up, go look at specimens. And I had lots of questions and I was always bugging the curators. So... Uh, by the time I was 18, I, I knew them. I mean, they knew me well. I was the crazy kid from the Lower East Side that, you know, came down and asked a million questions. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, it, there was no reality to a young person that there is cultural anthropology and physical anthropology, that there's uh, didactic ways of presenting data, that there's conversational and questioning ways of presenting data. You know, all of the kinds of things that include the human mind yeah. were not necessarily part of what you went to the museum to get. You went there to get educated. Yeah. Right? Because you were part of the unwashed masses. Uh -huh. And I thought that was cool until I got older. Yeah. And I started questioning. And then, uh, anyway, at, at what happened was when I got that job and I was working in animal behavior, there was a, a, I met a fella who said, we need, we're doing an invertebrate hall and we need uh, hundreds of ants to be mounted. Mm -hmm. uh, Honeypot ants, uh, no, leafcutter ants and wasps and, and this kind of ant and pogos and ponorines uh, and blah, blah, blah. And we're making all these exhibits. So, uh, and the taxidermist cost us, you know, $25 an hour. That's uh, because he's a man and he's, you know, he's a high position person. And we were wondering if you could do it, if you would mount these, because you work with ants all the time, and we understand that you're good with your fingers and all that. So I was sitting there going, wow. I was in a band, and what I really wanted to get was a French Selma sax, which was the Mark VI, was the ultimate saxophone. Were oh, you were a sax, sax player in the band? I was a tenor sax player. Nice. Yeah. So, like a rock band or a jazz band? Yeah, it was band? a rock jazz. Back... Uh, Back in that era, it wasn't so much you. You weren't delineated. Uh -huh. You you played you played the dead. You played Joanne Baez. Then you did some Dylan. Then you, you know you went all over the place. Okay. So bands hadn't gotten into the uh, fitting in a niche kind of area yet. Uh -huh. You're, and and we were a cover band, so basically you wanted to get on stage and have everybody have a great time. Okay. Well, so uh, he asked me. So I said yes. And I got to meet these wonderful people in the exhibits department at the museum. And they, um, and they were artists. And I had no idea that when you walked into the Museum of Natural History and you looked at the trees and the grasses with the, bowl, the bug holes and the little bit of feces and the squirrel looking, that none of that stuff was real. Mm -hmm. you know, tree, every leaf is made out of wax and this and the trees are all um, paper mache and, and went on and on and on and I got into that department because to mount these ants they gave me the ants and I went to visit mm -hmm. so they oh come on we'll, we'll introduce you to everybody in the department yeah, he's a scientist from animal behavior and you know a young kid and this stuff but he's going to mount the ants so then what I did is every species of ant that I was going to mount I went and I got as much literature as I could find now, this, for instance, I was working on, um, on a Neoponera velosa. I was making a little exhibit for them. But as far as I knew of, the, the reason they had all these long hairs, because I had read the French literature on it, was because that was an adaptation to primitive ants. And this, I had no idea about water cart carrying until I discovered it years later in Mexico, mm -hmm. in Yucatan, when I was doing another project. And an ant walked by carrying a drop of water. And I looked at it and I went, oh, huh. Like I said, they didn't know what they were talking about. Look what it's doing. Yeah. So, and I've been very lucky. I've had a lot of those junk in the mind comes out and actually gives you a serendipitous moment. Because yeah. if you're not informed, serendipitous moments don't happen. Well, we had one with their hanging larvae and the hairs. Yes, and that's Fidoli. right. In yeah. Fidoli. Yeah. Uh, so again, if, if the, the well-informed person is much more likely to make an unrelated discovery than the person who doesn't spend the time to inform themselves about the world around them. Mm -hmm. So uh, so anyway, I ended up doing this, uh, this project. And what I did is all the ants that I mounted, I mounted doing things. So leaf cutters were all carrying leaves. And uh, some were cutting the leaves. And I had the guys give me 
the artificial leaves that they were going to mount in the exhibit, and I would do a three-quarter cut and bend it down, then mount the ant as if it was cutting it off. So I was really trying to tell stories because the ants are all about storytelling. And I brought in all my boxes with all these ants, and I told them what all the stories were. And it was wonderful because the reaction from the exhibits people was, oh, you get it. This is what we want to be doing. We want to be telling stories with our exhibits. It's not just a frozen moment in time. A really good exhibit gives you a, a, a sense of place and how animals live in it. Well, I then, uh, uh, my, my, my post at Animal Behavior was coming to an end, and we were talking about what I would do next. And that's where I met Howard Topoff, by the way. So right. we became friends back when we were literally kids. He was just in college, et cetera. And uh, the people in exhibit said to me, you know, would you be interested in uh, taking an apprenticeship in the exhibits department? We need scientists because we can teach you how to sculpt it, but you'll understand how things work, especially taxonomists. And uh, I, I, I think Dr. Schneller was pretty aggravated with me when I said yes, and I took an apprenticeship in exhibits. Mm -hmm. I did that for about uh, two years and uh, became what they called an apprentice exhibits person. Mm -hmm. uh, and Alice came to me and she said, Jerry Rosen and some of the scientists at the museum think that this whole thing you're doing with art is a waste of time and you ought to come back to taxonomy. <laughs> and, uh, and, you owe, and, and she gave me the old, uh, she was a wonderful woman, she gave me the old look and she said, and you owe me. Mm. So I took a job in entomology as a scientific assistant, mm -hmm. basically not working on the things I love, which was ants, but I worked on spiders. And since we had no curator in a bunch of orders for, for a bunch of orders, the chairman told me, you will be in charge of all the orders for which we don't have a curator. So I got MBIDs and SOSIDs and I mean, it went on and on. Well, it was all stuff I loved. <laughs> so yeah. It didn't really matter. I was so excited about the job that it was great. But, uh, I mean, a great opportunity. And I worked there under Dr. Cook. And uh, he had come over from Oxford. And he was learning how to... And he was, had uh, really started working on macro photography, custom-making pieces. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about it. And he says, I need something machine that looks like this, that, and the other thing. Well, because of my experience in the exhibits department, I had full reign down there of any machine I wanted. So I told him, I'll mill whatever you need. But I, that means I mill too. Mm -hmm. So I had a wonderful education, beginning education in wildlife photography on the macro scale from him while I was doing my taxonomy. And at one point he went away and I decided I was going to uh, put together the collection in an organized way because Dr. Gurch, uh, Willis Gurch, had retired and he had types and hollow types and boxes on top of cabinets. Nobody knew what anything was. It was just, it was his personal thing uh, between him and Dr. Levy or Levy, who was his scientific assistant at the time, and they did the books, by the spiders, uh, Levy did. So I, uh, I spent an entire summer. Now, in the past, unlike what you guys would do today, what we had were big boxes, mm -hmm. and the boxes had perforations going all around the edges, and, every one of the, and it was a big card, and every perforation represented something, and you would define what it was. So if I wanted to have all of the salticids from Kenya, I would put a pin through the box and I would lift up all the cards and every card that was from Kenya would have the finished hole and every box that didn't would have been punched out. So that way you could get species, sex, location, time of year. It's a lot of data you could put in. So I decided that I was going to organize the collection. So I just worked on salticids all summer. Mm -hmm. By the end of the summer, not only did I know the salticids around the world really, really well, but I, everything was fresh, clean, all the bottles were redone, everything is in appropriate little white boxes, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, John came back from his trip to Europe and we were sitting around talking and he said, well, what do you plan on doing? And I said, well, right now I've gone back to school. I'm thinking about getting a PhD in entomology. But I'll tell you the truth. Um, this is uh, sort of daunting what you guys do here. I mean, you go out and collect stuff and then you name it, but it's just massive amounts of data. Yeah. And, uh, and, he, and he said, yeah, I think I'm getting out too. I'm going to go back to being a photographer. 
till he was leaving. And at the same time, uh, we had a donation of a million spiders from a person who died. Mm -hmm. And I walked through the lab, because the spider lab is several rooms, and I walked through the lab and I looked and I did the math, how many vials in a drawer, how many drawers, blah, 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 and the whole thing. And I figured that when the million spiders came in, I was well over 40 years of work looking at me. So I was looking at my retirement. And I lost my mind. Yeah. I said, I'm out of here. This isn't going to work. <laughs> I'm not going to do this forever. Uh -huh. So I'd already felt that it, it wasn't a job that would hold me. Mm -hmm. Not that it wasn't worthy, but I just my interests weren't to do that. And meanwhile, the department had asked me, Alice did it, and then I did it, to be the answer man. So you have to remember, it's New York City. Mm -hmm. And if somebody would call in, they'd have an insect question. Mm -hmm. wasn't an agricultural question or anything it's like it was I'm freaked out and it's in my sink kind of question yeah and they would shuffle them all to me mm -hmm. so my uh at first I didn't wasn't quite sure because I wasn't afraid of any of this stuff so it was how do I take on your persona you are jumping and climbing the walls on the other hand I think it's cool so it turned into a process by which I uh, got to a point where through storytelling, lack of fear, having people come to the museum, I really took every call on as a challenge. It wasn't just something I did and I was going to get off the phone as quickly as possible and tell them to go get raid. Uh -huh. right? I wanted to talk with them about their house, their conditions, why they were afraid, how we could get rid of that. And what I realized was that by doing that, I could help a person remove their fear of something, a spider or a a pill bug, I mean, things that people freak out about, you won't believe. And uh, that was a gift for life. That had more meaning than just about anything I was doing. I, said, I mean, you know, how, mu how many genitalia can you look at? Yeah. You know, after a while, it's just like, well, here's another set. Yeah. Uh, and this really helped people, and I enjoyed it immensely. So I decided uh, that I would go back to exhibits, because when I left, they said, look, if you decide that the taxonomy, the director told me, man, I have, I have caught a lot of slack from the science departments for bringing you into this department. He goes, but if you ever decide that you want to come back, just let me know and your position will be waiting for you. Nice. So I called him and I went back to being an apprentice in exhibits where I finished my apprenticeship, Yeah. And um, which was seven years. And then I worked there all told for the whole stint was 14 years at the museum. Wow, wow. Okay, we have to get into some of your greatest hits here. Um, <laughs> that was my greatest hit. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the, the, certainly no. a good one. Uh, because it, because it's the premise, the preface. Yeah, yeah, you know, for that, sure. And and so from there, so now I was getting calls. I was the answer man. Yeah. Then I started getting calls about the do it man. So I got a call from the was the one with the fuzz, and it was a Dick Van Dyke movie. Okay. And. Um, the, well, I mean, uh, how do you just get a random call from Dick Van Dyke? Well, the, I though? didn't. I didn't. Okay. Uh, the the switchboard. Now at the museum we had an old fashioned switchboard. Nothing went to a number. Uh -huh. So we had the ladies, and they sat there, reminding me very much of Saturday Night Live. I uh -huh. uh, would sit there and go, Museum of Natural History. What would you like? And then you know, da, 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 and then they, oh, huh. Well, we know a young guy who does bugs. Wait a minute. Click, and it was my phone. There you go. So that how Dick Van Dyke's on the other end, and, and no, it was uh, it was his uh, producer, right? Of course. And he said, "We need a bee to do this to fly around and and land and sting uh, sting Dick Van Dyke without stinging him, and it needs to climb down the cleavage of these actresses, and on yeah. and on and on." Well, gosh, that sounded great. And how much did I want to get paid? So I I said, "Wow, I knew what I was making a day, so I tripled it, right?" And I went and uh, and did the experience while I was doing it. Now, each one of these movies is a story. But while I was doing it... This is your first, this this is your is first, first call, call from Hollywood. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, yeah, correct. Yeah. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and, and it's very much New York. You get the, the prop ladies and the lady who brings in the coffee, and they're chewing gum. And they're, hey, boy, so what are you doing? You know, and uh, yeah, how'd you get this? What, what is this with bugs? You work at the museum with bugs? Uh -huh. No, no, I work in the exhibits department, but... But what, how'd you find out about bees? You, you got the bee, you cut its stinger? How did you do that? And, you know, so right away, what I started doing from the very beginning was looking at the animal, what the animal wanted to do, and what the director wanted the animal to do. Uh -huh. And then set up 
a non-intrusive uh, and, and non-destructive way of getting the animal to do that. Mm -hmm. And that meant flying harnesses, taking st stingers on bees and clipping the end. Uh, there was a million things that I could do without killing the bee, right? And having a little stuffed bee on the end of a stick that you walked around. So uh, I told her, and she said, what, they're paying you? Because New, York, New Yorkers are in your face. You know? So I told her, oh, I said, I'm getting this. She goes, listen, the guy who brings the coffee makes that much. You're in Hollywood. You got to charge a lot more money. Uh -huh. And so, oh, well, what should I charge? So they told me what to charge, the coffee ladies uh -huh. <laughs> and, the, and the hairstylist and, and that group of people. So that was the first, the first film. At the same time, remember we talked about Vietnam was going on. Yeah. And there was, there was a commercial. There was a series of commercials. Part of them were, were paid for by Nixon. And those commercials were all about sell the war. Mm -hmm. And then people of a different persuasion decided, the, because they had no money, the government had tons of money, they got the best agencies and all that. They were going to do a bunch of commercials that were going to be about unsell the war. And one of the ones that was written up was about ants. And... Uh, it, it really starts with an ant walking along, then the ant goes on a rock, then lots of ants come around, they all get on one side of a rock, and then the rock moves and the rock goes off a cliff, and an ant comes back, looks into the screen and wash, you know, washes its face. Meanwhile, scrolling numbers of how many people died and were wounded and all this is going along, along the side, and the ultimate message is, if enough of us get together, we can do anything. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me. I thought that was a really wonderful way to tell that, that message, get mm -hmm. it across. And so they called the museum. They asked me if I thought that could be done. And I had a beautiful colony of uh, Neoformica pallidofulva, which I thought would work great for that because I had them at home and they did all kinds of crazy stuff and I could get them to do mazes and things like that really well. And so I said, yes. So now, now I'm on a sound stage with art directors, and but everybody's of like mind, right? Because nobody's getting paid. Uh -huh. So that's the first thing. No money. Okay. Right? But, but this is, you know, to help end the war and blah, blah, blah. And okay, I'm, I'm with that. I'll do that. So I made a very light styrofoam and, and, um, and, and mud rock that looked very convincing. And then I put a magnet on the bottom of the rock and we had the board, and I put a magnet on the bottom, and the two magnets, and I could move a magnet, and that would move the rock. Right. Okay, so there was no strings, no nothing. Then with heat and light, I started with the one ant, and I had a colony, and we had a strong light coming down, and I warmed everything on one side, and I had one side cool, and I had a colony, and then I heated the colony. So the ants came out, they were looking for somewhere to go. So they went to the cool side of the rock and they just piled up on the cool side of the rock. And then I moved the rock across and there they went. Right? And then the last shot was just an ant coming over and that, that was easy to do to get an ant to just come over and look at the camera. I CO2'd it. And when they wake up, when they wake up, they all do the same thing. They sit up, they look at you and they clean themselves. Wow, what happened to me? You know, and they wash themselves. Yeah. So we got that shot. It, more importantly than the commercial, because that was a, it was a wonderful spot and played very well. But the thing was, I met all these like-minded uh, young art directors, uh, videographer, not videographer, film, filmologists, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cameramen, prop people, and all the rest of it. And over the course of the next couple, and they all said, this, my whole life has been like this. So this is what you do for a living? <laughs> So you go to the museum and you play with ants? Uh -huh. <laughs> and I say, no, no, I build the big exhibits. I build dioramas. I'm an apprentice and I'm learning how to, you know, stuff fish and yeah. mount fish and do this, that, and the other thing. And so uh, over the course of the next few months, they come and visit. And they were, you know, not yet full executives, but they were on the track, you know, mm -hmm. like gray advertising or wherever. And uh, little by little, it got to the point where they would, and we'd have lunch, and I'd show them everything we did, and they'd say, you know, we got grapes that are, we can never get them in season, because they're always in, in they're, uh, they're in, uh, in Argentina, and uh, by the time they get here, they're not what we want, but we need to do an air campaign. Could you make grapes for us? Could you make apples for us? Could you do this? Could you do that? And I said yes, and I, and I was making great money doing that on weekends. Yeah. And so that sort of introduced me to this art 
advertising, because they're different. Each right. one of the art communities is different. Uh, into the art advertising community in New York. You need to rewind? No, no I'm good. No, okay. I'm good, yeah. So when that was going on, there was a guy at the museum who stayed in entomology, uh, a, a lifelong friend, uh, Dave. And Dave actually um, had gotten a contact to do a movie called Creep Show. Right, yeah. And he asked me, would I help him? Uh, because he didn't know anything about wrangling roaches and how to do it and everything else. And by then, I'd already had about four years of working in advertising, uh, doing these props and everything. And I realized, and I knew the language. Mm -hmm. So uh, communication is about language. And each field has a way of seeing the world and expressing it in the vocabulary that they use. So I, I had started to understand the vocabulary of filmmakers and of advertising people, et cetera. So when I got together with the film crew, they, they immediately felt comfortable. Oh, this guy can do that. And we talked about props. And so I would say, oh yeah, I'll make a plunger and I can get the male ants because I'll hit them with a pheromone. I mean, the male roaches, I'll hit them with a pheromone and that really gets the males going crazy because that's why you see roaches by the sewers where there's a giant swarm. It's because there's a female that's just molted and she's put out mating pheromones. And so... It, for me, it was never, there was always testing because you can't guarantee and I don't want to come on set and be a fool and I don't want to waste the director's time and money mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to make a promise I can't keep. So I would always ask for time to test things and get roaches, try some of the chemicals that were available at that time, watch them absolutely go out of their minds, you know, jumping up and down, flying at a wall, you know, and so... Uh, I said, okay, we can do what we can do. And the plungers work the same way. Roach is coming out of the throat. Right. All of the shots that we did at the movie. And then Dave was, was, you know, my partner. And he would make sure that the giant walls made out of foam core were painted in fluon so that the roaches wouldn't get out. Uh, but I was the guy who got together with the staff, for instance, and told them, look, here's the deal. The... Uh, uh, what we're about to do now involves an animal that's been around for millions of years. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to fly in your ears and lay eggs. So I did a whole lunch hour just talking about cockroaches. Mm -hmm. With like the actors and, and With the... With the actors, yeah. the staff. Yeah. Forget the actors. Uh -huh. The staff is what makes it or breaks it for you. Okay. And, they built, and I designed the roach lab. Uh -huh. And so my feeling always was... So you tell people you work with ants, so you tell people you work with roaches or butterflies or anything. And for the most part, you see they look at you with this intense look, searching for the freakoid. Yeah. When are you going to leave the planet? When are you going to start twitching while you're talking to me, right? And so what I tried to do was create an environment that looked better, cleaner uh, than anything they'd ever expected. So... I designed the roach lab. And in the roach lab, because that many, I had 25,000 uh, Paraplanero Americana, I had 5,000 uh, Blabros Gigantea. You know, there's a lot of pheromones going on. It's a pretty odorous kind of a situation. So I designed 55 gallon drums, which had fluon on the top and were covered and had vents. And then each cover had a line that ran out that went to a carburetor or fans that blew the air out. So it was always coming in the bottom and going out. The room was absolutely immaculate. All the shelving was done in white. Walls were painted. I brought in pictures from the Southwest. Mm -hmm. I had flowers in the, in the place every day. All of our equipment was beautifully laid out for putting, for, for, for doing the harnesses for flying and everything else. And people would walk in and I know they go, you want to go in the roach room? <laughs> you know, and they'd look at each other like, yeah, let's go look at the weird guys. Uh -huh. And they'd open up the door and they'd go in and go, wow, this is better than my living room or house, you know? Mm -hmm. And it just, it diffused it all. And, and just the place you work in adds a level of respect. Right. And I knew that. And so that was one of the things I always worked on first. But anyway, Creep Show ended up being a, a big hit. Right. And Stephen King, and I got to meet all these wonderful actors and writers, et cetera. And, in the, and, and while that was going on, uh, I did an, another film, where they had wanted to do a monster snake called Spasms. Mm -hmm. And I sculpted the snake and I made a robot and everything else. And both movies hit 
within about two weeks of each other. Mm-hmm. One movie was a great B movie of the worst kind. All it was done by Canadian dentists, <laughs> and and all they wanted to do was get a movie so that it could go on uh, on TV late late night, and then they would put it in a in a video box and send it, and they would make a profit. They didn't care about the theater, you know. They just wanted it to go on the theater so they could say it was in a theater. Uh-huh. They didn't care if it was only for a week. Canadian right. dentists. Uh, Canadian yeah. dentists. Okay. They, they were the backers. Not, yeah. not that right. you know, they take care of your teeth very well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'd worked really hard on that film. I spent uh, an entire summer making the robot snakes and everything else. And that's that giant head of a, of a snake that sits in, my, uh, in the office. Uh-huh. And the movie came out, and it wasn't that I was suicidal, but I just felt like I'd wasted all this time. That the creativity and the wonder of what we'd done had been completely diminished by the quality of directing and filming. Uh-huh. But at the same time, or right after that, we did Creepshow. Mm-hmm. And that movie came out, and it was absolutely unbelievable. And George Romero is was a, was a wonderful guy. And what he did was he rented a movie theater for the staff. Mm-hmm. So we all went down to see a premiere of the movie, just us. We brought our families. I brought my mom and dad. And we sat around, and we laughed, and we had a great time. So there's a difference between a quality person who produces a quality product? Yeah. He'd already done Night of the Living Dead, right? Yeah. And uh, and somebody who's just trying to make a buck. Yeah. And and a lot of it has to do with the storytelling. And of course, the author for all of the stories is Stephen King. Yeah. So you there know, you go. not shabby. Yeah. It's first rate. So and you just said you brought your mom and dad to this premiere. I mean, I. Uh, your parents must have got a kick out of like you're you're building a career out of playing with uh, roaches and ants and uh, I mean, <laughs> what, yeah. What was their reaction to, to well, this career you started okay. inventing for yourself? So, I, so my parents are immigrants, uh-huh. and uh, their idea of what I should do was be a lawyer, a doctor, in the worst case scenario, be work at a correctional facility or be a postman or be a cop uh, because these were all jobs that survived the depression. Mm -hmm. So I'm old enough so that I'm the son of people who went through the depression, right? Mm -hmm. So they knew when when it got tight that blood counted, but that there were certain kind of jobs which sustained you. There were other jobs that went out the window. They never said, why don't you become a stockbroker? Yeah. All right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. uh, and so when I told him I was interested in insects, my dad was kind of like, oh, God, I would give anything for you to be a pilot. <laughs> but, you know, okay, you're going to do the bugs. You know, there was, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't disappointed as much as he, was, he surrendered uh-huh. to the process. My mother thought it was all very cute. Uh-huh. I'm, an only, I'm an only child, and my mom thought no matter what I did, as long as I didn't go get somebody pregnant or, or get in a traffic accident, that it was very cute. Yeah. And, uh, and when I was at the museum, they couldn't understand why I took a job in the entomology department. Uh-huh. They couldn't fed. I mean, can these people pay rent? Do they make enough money to actually have, like, a family? So I asked the, the chairman... I said, can I have my... Pa-? We had high tea. Museum always had high tea. So I said, can I ask my parents to come over for tea one day and meet the staff? So, the, so the, sort of the question was, why? And I said, and I told them, you know, the story. And I said, oh, absolutely. So I invited my parents. They came over. My dad had his own business as a dentist. So they came over. They, they wined and dined them, talked about their, their uh, houses in New Jersey and their kids going here and their PhD from there uh-huh. and on and on and on. And, and by the end of the afternoon, my dad stopped into the lab and he said, all right, this is okay. It's still strange, but at least you can make a living. <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then when I went into exhibits again, uh, his feeling was, you know, so art is dead in many ways because he had, when he first came here, he came here as a carpenter and he had worked in a, in a place that made very high-end furniture which later were, uh, were taken over by repeater lathes. So you had the one template and you ran a scroller through it and the lathe carved out whatever you're doing. And when that happened, he said, this is it. There's, no, there's not going to be any art left in America if we keep mass producing crap like this. Yeah. And that's when he went back to school uh, to start Orthodel. Mm-hmm. 
So th- that's, you know, your parents are always part of the story. I'm sure your parents are part of the story. Yeah, your parents definitely. are part of the story. At some point where you sit there, it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, you sit there and you go, this is what I'm doing. And you hope they don't say, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, that, but you ended up bringing them to premieres of famous directors, like well-known directors right. of movies. Like they must have had like, yeah, he made it. Like he made something out of himself doing it, this. It, but it was never, the difference was, that they always, and most Americans, I think, uh, think that way. It's, it's, it's uh, a safety net. You have a career, mm-hmm. right? I was doing wildlife photography and models for advertising, and I was doing special effects for movies. I was doing all kinds of stuff because basically for me, what was important was storytelling, and then what are the tools for storytelling, and how do you put them together? And how does my story, and this is something I learned from the advertising people, how does the story motivate people to change behavior? And that to me is probably the singular reason that I still build exhibits and design exhibits. We live in a world of madness. Mm -hmm. Uninformed, proud to be ignorant, uh, religious fanatics, you know, whatever level you want to put it on, that treats the planet like a personal garbage dump and has no respect. So for those of us who have an opinion about that and perhaps philosophical uh, bents that lead you in different directions, not to try to talk to people and change their opinion without being didactic, without making them feel stupid, without, you know, without any of that, being kind, uh, being uh, joining together, et cetera, et cetera. If we don't do it and it all falls apart, well, you know, we're it, in part, we're to blame mm-hmm. and you can't get away from it. So when I, when I, I learned the, the process for storytelling at the museum, I learned it from movie makers, from art directors, and I wanted more tools. So I took uh, photography at the School of Visual Arts in New York, in New York, Uh, I went to Columbia for storytelling, and we had wonderful authors who just came in and talked about the structure of a story, et cetera, et cetera. So I went on a storytelling quest, and what were the tools that I could use, which is anything that's around you. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, and I met many, many people in New York City, so I told Wyatt, it's too bad, uh, my son, said to him, we're living out here in rural Arizona, if you're interested in chess, you might have a friend or two friends that you might be able to get together with, and we live 100, 100 miles apart, uh, get together with once in a while and play a game of chess. New York City, we had a chess club. There were like 2,800 members. Yeah. There was a guppy club with over 600 members. Whatever you were interested in, there were hundreds of people that were interested in it. So it was a, a wonderful source of humanity to grow up in because people would hear something and it would somehow radiate or, or there'd be some empathy for something that they were doing and they'd say, could you help me with this? And my, my feeling was, yeah. I mean, the worst I can do is fail and I'm going to try not to do that. Mm-hmm. So I used to tell my advertising students, I would say, here's, here's what you can do for advertising. They were going to take a class. So I'd say, if you are comfortable with the idea of getting a ball of yarn and two knitting needles and climbing the Empire State Building, and jumping off, knowing that you will knit a parachute before you hit the ground, go into advertising. It's a good field for you. But if you think that that's an absolutely insane statement, go find something else for a career, because that advertising will eat you up and spit you out. Uh And so um, for me, that's always been, you know, there's no room. My only fear is failure. I'm uh-huh. not afraid of animals. I'm not afraid of people. I'm not afraid of, obviously, since I rodeo, I'm not afraid of horses. I'm just about afraid of nothing except failure. Failure uh-huh. is unacceptable. So I work very hard not to fail at what I'm doing. Uh-huh. And that is a conscious act because uh, mm-hmm. failure can seem to be uh, haphazard. But usually it means that if there were nine ways of doing it, you decided that this way was going to, you know, way one was going to be the way when it was really way five. And if you'd explored all nine, you'd already know that, that you had some place to go if way one didn't work. You could jump to way five. Mm-hmm. And that's a very important part of, uh, as far as I'm concerned, doing science. It's the whole hypothesis questioning 
uh, part of, of science is linear and is always looking for a, concu- co- uh, for a conclusion. And for me, uh, I agree with that, but I think that the journey is more important. And allowing yourself the ability to leave the, the, leave the ego and the id out of it and travel to tell your story and, and to, to continue discoveries as they lead you uh, is much more important. But I can do that because I'm my own boss. Mm-hmm. If you're doing a grant or you do have an NSF grant or something like that, and they expect in a year that you're going to have X number of conclusions, positive or negative, mm-hmm. they've already started to, remember I was saying, whatever career you're in, you learn a language. You also mm-hmm. learn a process. Mm-hmm. You learn a way of delivery. Uh, and I feel that in many ways that's stifling because the fun of science is discovery. Mm-hmm. And the fun of discovery is quite often an offshoot of a question, not the question. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's, you know, that's been part of the whole, uh, the whole adventure. Yeah. So you, you talked about communicating and, and, and it's changing people's behavior through, through them experiencing something that you do. And in your career is built on um, making museum and zoo displays of, of various things, uh, a lot of naked mole rats, a lot of social insects, but everything up to like elephants even mm-hmm. you've been been involved in. So I wonder um, I wonder if, if you think that there's like an overarching goal that goes through most of your work. like like for instance, have you have you ever, after you've installed something, gone into a museum or a zoo and watched people experience it and saw something and you said, oh, like that's, that's what I wanted. Like that was the end goal. Whatever I just saw that person, you know. I do that all the time. Yeah. So and what we do is that? With, we do it with formative evaluation and post-construction uh, evaluation. The, yeah, but what is it for you personally? The, for me? Yeah. If, um, there, there are three things that I would normally say. One is laughter. Mm -hmm. If I get a kid that walks up to an exhibit and goes, mommy, mommy, look at that, and starts laughing, or is just so energized that you watch that that spirit of a child go pop, right? That's that's the best. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other one is storytelling. I firmly believe that in the best exhibits, what they start is a dialogue between the people who are visiting. And that means that in some ways there has to be a certain amount of uh, humanity in the way that we present the information. So that grandma, great-grandma, or mom, or the kids, or somebody can turn around and go, you know that? Mm -hmm. And I really did that a lot in garbage museums Mm -hmm. uh, because I designed the first two garbage museums in the United States. And and my challenge was, I'm going to get you to go visit something that you just threw away. Wait, what? A garbage museum? Right. The first, I designed the first two garbage museums in the United States. Like a museum of trash. A museum of trash. Yeah. Okay. And I made trashosauruses, and it goes on and on okay. and on. And what had happened was I did a muse- uh, I got a call from uh, the director of the Museum of the Hudson Highlands. Uh-huh. And he uh, said, uh, we would like you to help us redesign our museum. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm doing it. At this point, I'd already left the Museum of Natural History. And I, and I, I wasn't angry with the museum. I mean, it was, it was one of those things that for all of you out there who are listening, mm-hmm. uh, if you work for a nonprofit, uh, the nonprofit part is your salary. So you're never going to make big bucks. Mm-hmm. And when I left, I felt that I was doing wonderful work, but the appreciation level through financial gain was very, very low, especially in New York City, because I was living in Manhattan, not a cheap place to live. Uh, advertising, on the other hand, paid huge amounts of money for you to sell garbage, and nobody cared about it and wasn't going to do any good for them. You know, it's newer, better, bigger, blacker, greener, whatever the hell it is. Yeah. Um, so the, the, that, to me, that whole thing about storytelling is a really important part of an exhibit. So when we did the trash room uh, with our Muppet who came up and talked about garbage, I, my uh, mandate to the artist was that no matter who you were, where you came from, or what your age was, that you would find a piece of garbage that you had thrown away in the trash room. Mm-hmm. Whether it was an old cast iron uh, bathtub, um, the latest thing that came out of the newspaper, something. 
everybody had thrown garbage away. I didn't want anybody to go into that room and say, this is not my problem. Mm -hmm. So when they entered the exhibit, the main part of the exhibit, they'd already had this sort of philosophical aha moment, right? And in the room, often what you had were people didn't leave. They would spend 10, 15 minutes looking at the garbage and going, oh yeah, remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Perfect. Uh huh. Right? Because now I've engaged you. Now you're going out with a curious mind instead of going to exhibits where there's tons of information and halfway through the exhibit, your mind has died mm -hmm. and there's nothing coming out. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just too much information. So when I went to see Picasso's show, I had no idea he'd painted so many people, so many paintings of people with two eyes on one side of the head. I mean, I thought of one or two or three. Yeah. I saw like a hundred. Uh -huh. So as I was walking through the exhibit, I, I realized that I cared. Blue period, green period, mm, chartreuse period, whatever it was. After a while, I wasn't seeing the art anymore. So I said to myself, you know, if I, when I go through 40 of these paintings, the 41st painting, when you kind of look at it, shot water out of the eye and shot you with a shot of water, you would go, whoa, did you see that? And you'd start looking again. Uh -huh. nothing else, one wondering which other one was going to shoot water at you. So what you need is something that goes pow and wakes people up. And exhibits that don't have that, uh, to me, just become what, what we call the streakers. So there's two kinds of people that go to exhibits. There's the streakers and the grazers. The grazers read every label. They look at everything. They analyze. You know, they're, they're the, the kind of exhibit person that a designer dies for. Not your average visitor. Mm -hmm. Seven seconds is all they'll give an exhibit. And then there's the streakers who come in and are focused on one thing that they want to see. They run, they look at it, they go the other way, they go to the other thing, and if you can catch them, you're lucky. That's why when they did the show on motorcycles in New York, if some of the highbrow people were like, oh, motorcycles, we don't want a, a, a big show on the art of motorcycles when we've got all these wonderful high art. And the director said, yeah, well, you know what? We got more people coming to the motorcycle show than we've had to any of our other shows. And they walk around the rest of the museum too. So you got to bring them in, mm -hmm. which means that you have to humanize what you're doing so that you become relevant to the public. Uh, and so those three things, relevancy, family and storytelling, and getting having those moments where people laugh, scream, shout, whatever but it takes them outside of the bounds of normalcy for how they respond to things. I mean, without actually doing anything horrible to them, yeah. uh, are very important. Yeah. So, cool. and, and I do that even in um, exhibits. So right now, one of the exhibits we're doing, you're going to go to the men's room or you'd go to the ladies' room. Mm -hmm. You walk in and you, now you're going to wash your hands before you leave. When you go in and you start washing your hands, you break a beam and there's a big mirror in front of you. And the mirror goes clear, and it's a wall of roaches, all scurrying about, right? Uh -huh. uh, that, to me, will be an aha moment. If they don't do anything else in the rest of that exhibit, they will go home, and they will tell their friends, the mirror went clear, and there were like 500 cockroaches on the wall walking around. So now you have something that they will tie to, and they'll come back and bring their friends to visit it. And, and perhaps they'll, they'll further explore the rest of the environment that you gave them. Mm -hmm. So every exhibit should really have something that twists your head just a little bit. I've done a lot, uh, well, not a lot, I've done four exhibits where you look into a cave, you look into a tree, you look into an old barn, and while you're looking inside, um, a light comes on, and what you're looking at is a dead deer or a dead cat or something, and there's thousands of domestic beetles or thousands of fly maggots crawling all over the sculpture. Uh, oh, and it's a sculpture piece with the food put on it. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to watch kids because they run to their parents and drag them over and make them look. Yeah. Right, and you cook in the night. That's the goal, yeah. Yeah, and who can deny their kid? So now we're going to call, we'll talk about decomposition. A lot of people will look at decomposition. I'm going to go, something rotten, it's going to smell? Uh -huh. I'm not even going to go near it. Uh -huh. now, now I've got a kid sticking your head in it to look at exactly what's going on. And, and those, uh, the other one is control. So we were, I went, I, was, I designed the insect zoo at the Smithsonian. First I went and sat in the insect zoo for a week. I wanted to see what worked and didn't work. 
they had on the left-hand side when you walked in this wonderful exhibit of a section through a piece of pavement. And it was the, uh, and it was the fire hydrant and it was all the pipes underneath and that was their roach exhibit. And they had tons of paraplanata in there running around. People came in and it was like magnets. They bounced off. They never went to the exhibit. They came in, they just kind of look and they go, whoa, and, they, and they'd be gone. So that whole end of the insect zoo wasn't an exhibit because mm-hmm. 90% of your crowd doesn't get it. And if 90% of your crowd doesn't get it, I really don't care what the curator says, it doesn't work, right? So I was looking at different ways of communicating things that people don't like. And I came up with an idea which was, I'm going to give you control. So we did a wall at another exhibit. Uh, We did a wall of animals that live in your kitchen. And it was a flat. And it was nothing. It was just a painting of a kitchen with all these flaps laying around or, you know, hanging from Mm -hmm. it. And so what you did was you picked up the flat. And under the flat might be cigarette beetles. And under this flat might be cockroaches. And, you, and, and I sat there and I watched, because I had this thing, this is intellectual. Um, I didn't have a chance to test it. I tested many other areas, but I didn't test that one. But I just had this gut feeling that if people are in control, they'll look at things that they won't look at if they're not in control and they feel totally grossed out. Then they're going to run away. And it worked like a million dollars. So you got, cockroaches, conk. Mm-hmm. Ethel, come here. And they both come over and they, Open it up. Oh, God, those are in my house. Blah, 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 blah. But it was, she, if you put down the handle, it was closed. You had to physically open the exhibit in order to look at the cockroaches. And then on the top of the, the panel was all the information about the cockroaches. And so now they've, got, they, they've passed the gross out, I got to run, throw up, cry, you know, kill people. They've gotten to look at the roaches. And then, uh, then the next thing they do is they read the label. And it's, if I just had a label about cockroaches, first of all, they wouldn't look at the exhibit, and no less are they going to read the label. Now we got over 80% of the people to really spend time looking at the exhibit, and they all read the label, and they all remember what they read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So these are all little tricks that are really important in storytelling, because it's not just the story. It's how you get it across, the physicality yeah. of it. Yeah, cool. Well, we've only got a couple more minutes, and... Uh, there's so much else we could talk about. So let me just rattle off some things and end on what I what I want to hear. Um, so we could have talked about Alien mm-hmm. when you're involved in the movie poster and your invention of the slogan everybody knows in space right. no one can hear and you hear scream. We're not going to talk about that. We could have talked about Silence of the Lambs, the, one of the most scary. Yeah, it scared exactly. us while we were doing it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. We could have talked about that. Uh, we could have talked about like Ronald McDonald and Hamburglar. Right. Not going to talk about that. Oh, um, yeah, Animal Kingdom for Disney. Yeah. I, there's a lot uh, of Trail of the Elephants in Australia. Yeah. I've been very fortunate because I wasn't any one thing. I, I was, and, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll just bring this up quickly. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine who's an architect, we were sitting with a bunch of architects and I come in with a company by the name of Workers Play. Uh-huh. And they look at you like, what the hell, what does that mean? And he said, and, the, and this buddy of mine is a very well-known architect, he looked at everybody and he said, he's the only designer that I know who actually knows the science. That is probably the most important part if you're going to design for museums, for uh, natural history, of uh, uh, environments for zoos. If you don't understand the natural history of the animals that you're working with, then what you're doing is you're trying to fit everything into a pigeonhole, and that is the biggest insult to the environment, the ecosystems, and the animals that you're working with that you could possibly do. Mm-hmm. So knowing it uh, and understanding it, and then meeting people like yourself and going to the conferences mm-hmm. and sitting around and having a lot of laughs. Uh, I don't claim to know much of anything. I just uh, surround myself with really good people and then absorb Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on. And I've always preferred the mentoring system uh, to the hardcore textbook learning system. Mm -hmm. But you have to be mentored by people, A, who care, and B, 
who are really good at what they do. Because, uh, and it's one of the reasons why when I design exhibits, I, I talk about the presenters as being uh, leaders in an adventure. So I don't like carts with his bones and skulls and things like that. I would rather have you walk through an exhibit, talk to people, and depending on which way the conversation took you, you would then could pull out a bone, you could pull out a scat, you could pull out a claw, you could put out whatever you needed to complete the story, you would put it away, you were more like a magician, right, inside of the exhibit space. Well, think about it when you're teaching your classes in the field, you don't know that you're going to find this ant right there or right here, but your story weaves through serendipitous discoveries mm -hmm. in the field. A good teacher will get you where they want you to go, no matter what they see. A bad teacher can only teach what's in the book. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, uh, I have no patience for that, and I probably didn't have it by the time I was uh, 14, 15. I really like learning in sort of a, a holistic, all-around way uh, for everything else. But Silence of the Lambs, uh, we had a lot of fun making that movie. I had to make costumes out of fake nails. Right. Uh, I made the moth that went into the... And, and of course, this all has to do with being an artist also. So I could have made a costume out of a fake nail, figured out a glue that allowed the wings to flex and talk to the people at Dow Chemical if I was just linear in the way that I was looking at it. Again, I was looking at all possibilities until I got something that allowed me to both make a flying harness and a costume to turn one kind of moth into another kind of moth so I could fly them around set Yeah. and, and figure out how to do that so that the animals... Uh, so I could have the animals waiting like airplanes at, a, at an airfield and I could pop them up and use one. And when it got tired, I go get another one and use another one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other part was the, the pupa that's in the woman's mouth. Well, she was a real woman. She wasn't a, a dummy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to stick a piece of plastic down her throat. And I didn't want to stick the real thing. I had no idea you're a Canadian. I mean, it could, there'd be so many things that could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I started experimenting. Uh, and I ended up coming up with gummy bears and Tootsie Rolls. And I made a mold, and then I poured the gummy bears and Tootsie Rolls into that, and it came out looking just like the pupa. And I could use a little food co coloring to add a little bit of scale detail and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And now if she swallowed it, she ate a candy. Right, 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 right. And I had the plastic one, so they reach down and they start to pull it out, and then there's a little bit of a cut. And then they get the whole thing out. Well, that's a plastic one. That's the one that's over there. Mm -hmm. And that one um, is perfect. That's a hardcore model of it. And they put that in the alcohol. Mm -hmm. right? And talking to the scientists while we were doing the movie, the actors came and spent the day with me. The directors told the actors who were going to be the museum scientists, go, go hang out with Mendes for a day. All right. So there was all kinds of things that happened. One of them told me, he said to me, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a taxonomist and I'm working at a museum and uh, all these big collections of butterflies and insects are laid out before me and, and, and she's, um, you know, and she's coming in with this information. And so we were talking back and forth and I said, nah, you know, you love science, but you also love playing. So you're playing chess with a bunch of beetles, right? And so when she walks in, that you, you guys are trying to get the, the Beatles to go to different areas because you really are a little off. Be off. You know, be the crazy. Don't just act the crazy. So he kind of looked at me and he said, well, you know, she's very pretty. And I said, you bet she is. Do you think I could ask her out? And I said, of course you can ask her. What, man, you died? I mean, you know, be, be the Indiana Jones. She comes yeah. in and say, hey, uh, would you like to go out for a hamburger or you know, whatever it is right. that you want to say at the moment? But of course you're going to hit on her. And if you get shot down, so what? Mm -hmm. uh, so th th I've had a lot of fun working with people and, and trying to get them out of the stereotype of what it is to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. And that look and the way of presenting stuff and the way the eye contact is made and all that. I, I met and know tons of scientists, first of all, who were musicians. Uh, Dick Zweifel... It, from the museum, who was the chairman of the herpetology department, he had to decide whether he was going to play a jazz trumpet or be a, or, or be a taxonomist. It was torn, right? Because it's all about rhythm. Science, to me, 
is about seeing the flow in the patterns of nature. So if you're doing a movie, bring it in. Yeah. You know, don't leave it there. And I think really, the, uh, I always tell uh, young people, if you're going to be a scientist, uh, play in a band, take ethics, mm -hmm. take debate. Because you're going to have to argue with people about your discovery. A lot of people are going to go, you're crazy. Like when we, when I first got involved with Naked Mole Rats and I went to Natural History Magazine and I said they found it. Because when we were kids, we'd all talked about how invertebrates could never be cool, as cool as vertebrates. And the reason was, um, or vertebrates could never be as cool as invertebrates because we really thought the invertebrates were much cooler. And the whole thing with the selfish gene came out mm -hmm. and the imperatives of reproduction and, reprodu you know, and, and, and replication and all that became so important. We all said, well, that's not going to happen. And then late at night, I got a call from a buddy of mine and said they found them. This is like eight years later. I knew just what the conversation was. So the nerdness never went away. I yeah, mean, yeah. you know, the focus was yeah, always yeah. there. And he said, they found these things called naked mole rats. And he went on and on and on and on. So I went to Natural History uh, magazine. I talked to the editor and I said, there's this animal. I got to go, I got to go photograph. They're, they're in South Africa right now. And he looked at me and he said, oh, Ray, you know, you guys, you spend a lot of time in the jungle and who knows what kind of stuff you're eating. He said, this animal doesn't exist. It'll be proven that all that's wrong. So there was no market, mm -hmm. but I kept it in my head. I kept looking for whatever I could find. This is now everything's on the internet. You know, right, easy right, to right. find. You're talking about a completely different era. And um, I did a story on life in a tree. So I had another D Discover magazine said, I sold them a bunch of stories on frogs and insect evolution and insect adaptation. And the editor came and said, what do you want to do? It's the middle of winter. So I said, I want to go live in a tree in Costa Rica. And, uh, and I'll, one tree, and I'll film the, the, you know, the ecology of that one tree. I came back, they loved the articles, one of the biggest articles they ever published in Discover. And he said, what else do you want to do? And I said, there's these things called naked mole rats. And I want to go film them. And I told him what, what I had heard. And he goes, let it, our researchers will look into it. And the next thing you know, he said, we found the guy here in the United States, Paul Sherman. And Paul is working on uh, youth social behavior. And he has a colony in Naked Moretz. So I got to go meet Paul. And we did a story that ended up being so comprehensive. I made sets for the animals to express behaviors that it ended up being the foundation for the photography of the biology of the naked mole rat, which is a real tome. Because yeah. what they said was, we're not coming out with individual papers because we're going to be fighting all the time. People are going to be saying it can't be. So we're going to put it all together. And we're going to come out with a book and say, here, fight this. Right? And so, and, and uh, after I did the article, he called me one day and he said, you basically shot the book. Can we use your pictures? And I said, sure, I already got paid for them by Natural History Magazine. Yeah. Uh, and it was Princeton Press. And I don't think they paid very well. I said, don't yeah. worry about it. Uh, but th those uh, sort of moments all come together only because you're in, in the middle of constantly being reflective and thinking and outgoing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's wrap it up. Give me one minute on Errol Morris. Oh, <laughs> all right. So now I've done the naked... Okay, Errol Morris. Yeah. I I've done the naked mole rats for Philadelphia. Uh -huh. So what happened was I did the article... The zoo was calling around trying to find somebody. To, they had gotten a colony and they wanted to display them, but nobody knew how to do it. They called Paul. Paul said, the guy just came in here just from the Museum of Natural History and on and on and on. And he just built all these sets. And he actually got, he built sets after talking with me that got the uh, mole rats to do exactly what we wanted them to do. He goes, I didn't think it could be done. He's the guy. So I designed that exhibit, uh, the first one in the United States, which is at the Philadelphia Zoo, mm -hmm. uh, an exhibit on naked mole rats, although I did it on you social behavior. Mm -hmm. We did termites, dwarf mongooses, and naked mole rats. And it, so some time goes by. And at this point, in order to do experimentation, they're giving me two mole rats, and, but I, uh, because they, we didn't want to do intrusive experimentation, but you can't experiment without the animal. Right. So I took them home to New York. And they said, if they have babies and all that, you can buy them from us. So I did. And it cost me like $4,000 mm -hmm. because they had babies like crazy. I have 19 at a time. You know, this gets expensive. Um, one day I get a call from this fella, Errol Morris. I didn't know him. And he says, we're doing a movie. 
and we're looking to interview people about different things that they've done in their lives. And we like to, uh, what do you think about naked mole rats? So I went off on, you know, one of my, this is such a, this yeah, is the yeah. animal of the century. What a cool beast and all that. And he said, well, you come to Boston and uh, we'd like to interview you. And so it ended up that the movie was about people who had passions in life for which there was no conclusion. Yeah. And Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control uh, actually came from the, uh, the fellow who did the robotics because he said instead of going into space and spending a bazillion dollars on one robot that lands on Mars and then hits a hole and the bazillion dollars just went down a hole, what you do is you create 2,000 little robots, each one that only responds to one element, and you scatter them all over the environment, and then you just pick up their signals and they'll tell you all about what's going on there. So they're fast, they're cheap, and you don't try to control them. Yeah. There's no radio. They're just out of control. Right. So... That was sort of where the title of the movie came from. But it's basically the story of Sisyphus uh -huh. and, uh, and, and just climbing up a hill and rolling a rock. So to be in an Errol Morris movie, you had to go to Errol Morris? Yeah. That was cool. Come on, Errol. Jeez. No, no. That's well, no, he travels. For, uh -huh. for, for us, he wanted to do everything at a studio. And you have to remember that to do an independent film, uh, quite often... Uh, he had to make money doing advertising. Uh, we yeah, didn't, right, we didn't right. get paid or yeah, anything. Yeah. Oh, you but didn't? It, no, no. But I, if you look at the poster of the movie, you'll see there's a dollar bill signed by Errol Morris. That's my payment. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. But the <laughs> but the only thing the only thing was, but he paid for us. I mean, he paid full freight dinners. Yeah. And everything. yeah. And you could also dress any way you wanted. And at that time in life, I wore a lot of bow ties. So oh, he I didn't got... dress you in that. You no, dressed yourself no, I, in that. Oh, yeah, okay. self-dressing. Uh -huh. Everybody was self-dressed. And I wore bow ties in, in New York all the time. Uh -huh. I mean, I went to parochial school. You wore a suit or a bow tie all the way through high school, every yeah, day. Yeah. I didn't own play clothes. I owned old suits uh -huh. <laughs> and old shirts. Uh -huh. That's what I played, old white shirts that I played in. But when we got there, uh, he has that in... in uh, in, in Teratron, in, in Teratron, yeah. in Teratron. Mm -hmm. and it's very strange because really there's a screen here and you're looking right at him. Yeah. He has the same thing. Yeah. So where most cameras, they tell you, don't look into the lens or look into the lens. With him, I'm doing this and he's right here. So he's asking me questions and I'm, I'm you know, answering them yeah. and the camera is really shooting right through the middle of it. Yeah. And so it's a really intense uh, way of filming. Uh -huh. and, it's, and, he, and he asked some questions that were inappropriate. Uh, so... Like in anything else where it's a, you have to set limits. Yeah. And I, I know from the past that if you don't uh, and you say something, well, you won't use this, they do. Right. Right. So you have, to, you have to edit yourself very strongly. And I tend to not be a person who worries about that. Yeah. But you don't want to be in a big movie and be saying something that, about somebody or anything else that's right. rather sad. And uh, so a couple of times I stopped them. I said, well, that's it. I got up and walked away. Uh, I was in the middle of divorce as part of it, and uh -huh. I didn't want to talk about that uh -huh. on a movie because uh, he wanted to blame it on the naked mole rats. Uh, mm, you know, yeah, not true. Right. Uh, so, uh, so there was that, and there was also... So we, we settled that. We got all that worked out. And, but the one part that he said was the scariest... He said he interviewed the scientists, and they were all very dry, and they wanted to talk about the data and the statistics and all that. He goes, I talked to you, and you're, you're, you're talking about them like family. You were completely flipped out, and it was so great. They're like your kids, you know? I said, well, they are. <laughs> uh, but that was why he picked me, mm -hmm. not because of my credentials in it, because mm -hmm. there were many PhDs that he also interviewed that he decided he didn't want to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but I told him, because I'd been in several movies where I'd been misquoted, and and because it was about honey, it was about leaf cutter ants and other things. I saw people crying because one guy was talking about the wonders of having pets, and his mo movie was all it was like a pet -a movie, all about the horrors of having pets. And he made everybody who was in the film look like a fool, and he twisted their words. It was really cruel, right? Mm -hmm. And I walked out of, the, and people were like, and he, and he said, "Hey," and he's very, ri very rich family, and he said, "Hey, you don't like it? Sue me." Right. And I walked up to him and I said, you know, you were lucky that I did the thing on the leaf cutter ants and you really, it was so strange, you really couldn't do anything negative about it. And he looked at me and he said, why? And I said, because if I was one of these people, you would be going to the dentist now. <laughs> and he kind of backed up, you know, because I would have knocked his teeth out. Yeah. Um, there, there comes a point where you can't do that to somebody and think they're going to lay there like a rag. Yeah. Uh, so 
with that as a background, I told them that when they did the movie, I had to edit it. Uh huh. Or I had to review it before, because you have to sign a consent form. Right. So I won't sign a consent form until I reviewed the movie. I said, I have nothing to do with how you edit it, what said, how you clip it or anything else. But if you make me out to be a fool, if it ends up looking like you, you, your goal is to make people seem foolish. And we talked, and he knew the films. We talked about these, these other venues. Uh, then I'm just not going to sign it. Mm -hmm. And you can, but he goes, oh my God, but we've done all this filming and it's, you know, it's a half an hour of integration. And I, and I said, and it's my name. Mm -hmm. And I really don't care. Mm -hmm. So, so they sent me to film, they'd done the entire movie and they had uh, put it all together and they sent it, but I hadn't signed yet. And so I called them and I said, oh, I think this movie is great. I mean, the stories, the way you weave them together starts out with individual stories that end up being all about the same goals and about the same, you know, people moving through space mm -hmm. uh, in a philosophical way that really works. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, and I've already signed the form. He goes, they opened up a bottle of champagne in the back. They were so happy. Nice. Ah! That's awesome. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and that... But it was a great experience, and I've shown it in many on many venues to schools, et cetera. And I I can't tell you how many college kids have come up to me afterwards and said, "Why don't they make more movies like that?" Mm -hmm. And I always tell them, "Because you're all being trained to go to movies full of psychopaths mm -hmm. that go out and slaughter humanity as if this is the right thing to do. We don't train ourselves to go to intellectual movies anymore." Mm -hmm. So that was uh, part of the you know cool. part of that. But he, it was a great. It was a great experience meeting him also. He's a very cool guy. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we got to sign off because we, okay. we got to go. But thanks for yeah. talking to me. This is awesome. Yeah. It's been my pleasure. Awesome.